Thanks very much. Welcome everyone to the second of the Botany 360 workshops, this one on writing a good abstract. I'm Bruce Kirchhoff at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. I've been studying and teaching scientific communication for a number of years now. And as I mentioned already, I have a new book out on that, which I hope you'll consider. I'll let my colleague from University of Veracruz introduce himself also. Thank you, Bruce. Hi, everybody. I'm Eliezer Kokoletsi from Mexico. I'm professor at the University of Veracruz. I met Bruce at the Botany Congress in 2019 and in a workshop for presentation skills. So it helped me make me my ideas clearer to share in my presentations and teach with my students to make them to make them. So I hope this workshop enables you to make appropriate abstracts for, for your research. Thank you. So we'll start with a little brief introduction uh, to abstracts. I'm gonna keep this very short because I wanna spend most of the time having you consider some abstracts and consider the structure of abstracts because you're really gonna learn the most if you work with these other abstracts we, um, and look at how people have structured a number of different abstracts. So you don't just get the general broad picture which I'm about to give you, but you get to see how people have applied it in a number of different no, very different ways, because there's a lot of variability in how people apply these general rules, which I'm going to give you. Throughout, we're going to apply Einstein's dictum that we're going to try to do things simply. We're going to, you can find lots of um, instructions on the internet about how to write an abstract. The one from nature is really great, but it's very complex. It's not for people who are beginning to write abstracts. And for writing an abstract for a talk, it is um, unnecessarily complex. For writing an abstract for nature, it's great because some of the nature abstracts are some of the best abstracts you'll find out there. And the reason is they've given very specific instructions on how to do it. So we're gonna not take the nature approach, we're gonna take a very simple approach, but something that then lets you expand on your own, that is work with your own abstract and find the other parts of it that you might need to include. We find these general areas, which I'm about to introduce. So the general parts of the abstract, of which there are going to be four, but there are three that are really important, which is where we're gonna start. First of all, the first thing in the abstract should be what's already known. So what is all, what's the background of your research? This isn't a long part in the abstract, but it kind of sets the stage for the next thing that's to come. So the background, one or two sentences, and then what the problem is. What is it that you're working on? Why is that knowledge that we have now incomplete? Why do we not just stop there? Why background knowledge stop, we're done with it. Science is over. Why, that's not the case. What is the problem? What is your problem? Concited, stated as concisely as possible. And then the third part is what your conclusions are. The people who attended the workshop on titles know that I want you to write a title that gives this main conclusion, that gives the overall conclusion of your work. So this is the third part that goes in the abstract. It also, it's elaborating on what you're, what's in your title then. This usually goes near the bottom of the abstract. So we've got a little introduction up there, what the situation is now, what your problem is, at the bottom are your conclusions, and what's that stuff in the middle? Well, that stuff in the middle is what most abstracts are consisting of, that is what you did, the results. And I have not put this in order when I first presented this because <clears throat> young scientists tend to overemphasize their results. This is very natural because it's what you spent all your time on. You've got man, a lot of time getting doing this research. Um, you know this area, you know the techniques very well, and you naturally just want to tell everybody about that. But that's not what people care about in an abstract. What they want to know is what the background is, what the problem is, and what you found. And then you should tell them in the middle of that abstract a little bit about what you did, but not go into tremendous detail. Later on, I think we'll have a chance to look at some abstracts where there's just all oh, tons of detail in that middle, really technical detail that no one outside that lab is going to understand but your abstract is not speaking to members of your lab. Your abstract is speaking to a more general audience. 
You want to speak to a more general audience for a whole lot of reasons. One, you're, you're going to a more general conference if you're going to the Botany 2022 or future Botany meetings. If you're going to a very narrow, narrow conference, you know, if you're going to a conference that's only on bee gut microbiome, that's a different kind of conference than we're talking about. And you might want to write a slightly different abstract for that. But for this general conference, it's going to be you're talking to ecologists, you're talking to um, physiologists, you're talking to people who do phylogenetics, you're talking to this broader range of people. And you want to do that. Not only are you going to talk to them, but you want to do that because you want your name to be out there to a wide variety of scientists so that when they have research or job opportunities open, they'll think about you. Now, research opportunities are going to come in your specialty, but job opportunities come usually from universities that are looking for someone in your specialty because they don't have anyone in that specialty already. They're looking to fill a gap. And so you want to be reaching those people who might be offering a job in the future, and you want your name to be on their minds. So putting lots and lots of detail about you know, how you set up your, um, your sequencing or exactly how you did your field collections or how you measured the water potential in the vines that you were looking at, all that very technical detail really doesn't belong in these abstracts. It's not what it, it reads restricts your audience to the people who already know your field. So these three, these four parts then look like this. So we have the current state of knowledge, the problem you're working on, some part of your results, and then your conclusions. And the people are really going to be interested in that, especially in those conclusions. Look at some abstracts to see how this might look at. And this might look like got some abstracts from nature here. As I say nature abstracts are usually very well written and <clears throat> they can generally be understood by people outside the field. So here we've got one on SARS CoV 2. Yellow is the first part of it where we've talked about the background. So we know that there's um, bone marrow plasma cells, we know that they have antibodies, we know that individuals recovered from COVID 19, they have a substantially lower impact. Um, chance of reinfection. So all this stuff is known before you started your research. So what's the problem? Well, here in pink, then we have the problem. Serum antibodies decrease rapidly, and then may, there's maybe problems with generating um, long-term immunity. And then <clears throat> what, did they, what did they find? Well, they found our results indicate mild infection can induce long-term robust antigen-specific hormonal, <clears throat> humoral immunity in humans. So you see that that's really, it's really interesting. Now, even if you don't work on this, it's an interesting result, even without knowing anything that's in white there. The white stuff is elaboration. So if you want to attract someone to your talk, concentrate on those three areas. And you'll get a, I think you'll get a better audience because they'll know exactly what they're going to expect when they come in. And for those who attended the <clears throat> title workshop, we see that that gray part at the very end is an elaboration on what we had in the title. In fact, a couple of weeks ago when we worked on titles and we worked through ab some abstracts, we often looked at the very bottom of the abstract to find what the conclusion was, the main conclusion from this research, and we reworded that in a shorter form and made that the title. So by reading the title, the person who is looking, just scanning down the abstracts um, in the abstract book or on the web page can see right away from the title whether they're interested or not. And I think a great thing about this kind of approach is that even if you don't work in this area, a clearly stated title and a clearly stated abstract will draw people in. I mean, I don't have a tremendous, except for what everyone has about SARS-CoV-2, you know, the general interest these days, because it affects us all. I don't have any really interest or knowledge in this work, but I'm intrigued by it because I read these very clear titles and I say, well, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. And so I start looking at the paper. We'll look at two more examples. This one's about organic management. <clears throat> Again, the yellow is 
about insect populations, and they've <clears throat> been um, there's insect pests on organic farms, and they've been attributed to um, reduced pest population. That is, there are uh, there are predators, and we thought that the increase in those predators under organic management reduces the pests. And there's also uh, changes in nutrient content. So again, prior knowledge, but plant resistance hasn't been taken into account in these kinds of studies. So they did some work and they found that organic managed, organic managed soils um, play uh, an unappreciated role, that they actually are quite important in reducing uh, plant attractiveness to pests. And so there's an additional advantage to organic management here. And then the middle part talks about exactly what they did, how they, show, how they showed those kinds of things. And again, we can see that the ending has been used in the title, and the title tells us directly what the findings of this research are. Organic management promotes natural pest control through altered plant resistance to insects. Can't be any clearer than that. Really a wonderful title that draws people in. One more example. <clears throat> A little bit different this time because there's a lot more information here about the background. So the exact percentage that you have in these different parts really is kind of up to you and you're going to have to play with it about your research and think about what, how much do they need to know of the background of your research in that yellow portion to understand what your question is. And you put just enough there for them to understand it. Obviously, these authors thought that <clears throat> this is a title. This is a talk from a, an abstract from a talk. They thought they needed a little more information here. So I'm not going to read this one quite as well, quite as thoroughly because it's got a lot more information here. But again, if you've been reading it while I've been talking, you can see that there's background about um, snow melt and flowering and things. And then they, another thing they did here is they found a different way of introducing their problem. Instead of saying, Here's the background, but we found, but this is the problem. They said, here's the background and we hypothesize. So just another kind of wording to kind of vary up how you present your problem. <clears throat> so they hypothesized that plants in Northern latitudes with a strong seasonality would find significant effects from uh, the timing of slow melt on phenology. And then they found that that wasn't the, um, that at least parts of, in part of, in part that wasn't the case in the gray. And then they put that up in their title: timing of snow melt and amount of winter precipitation have limited influence on flowering phenology in a tall grass prairie. We will go on in here in a minute after we have a chance for questions and look at some examples, many more examples, with you working through them and looking for these four different parts of of abstracts. But before we do that, does anyone have questions? You can put questions in the chat or unmute yourself and ask them directly. Hi, I'm Julissa Roncal. I'm from the Department of Biology at Memorial University of Newfoundland. And I have a question regarding the last abstract that you showed us. The section that highlights the conclusions in gray. To me, that sounds more like results and not so much as conclusions. I think, you know, many of us have, um, you know, some problems distinguishing the results section versus conclusions. And to me, that, that those sentences sound more like results. Yes. And I think you'll see that when we come to looking at the abstracts from talks as opposed to journal articles that there is more confusion there about results and, con and conclusions. And I kind of wanted you to, I want you to see that. We'll come to that and see more of it later. And you'll see the, I hope you start seeing the necessity of trying to separate those two. So <clears throat> I think this is a problem of that. We as young scientists, or I'm no longer a young scientist, but I used to be a young scientist. <laughs> Having spent upon all that time doing the research, we get so focused on, our techniques and the little results that we kind of forget the big picture. And one of the things I really want to emphasize in all of these workshops is that big picture is very important. Not only is it going to attract people to your talks, but when you write a grant, the grant 
uh, reviewers are going to want to know what that big picture is. They're going to want to know what the big question, you know, NSF is really fond of saying transformative research. You know, the transformative research is not what you measured in the field or how you use this technique or those kinds of things. They won't consider that transformative. It's going to be something about, so here, this is more transformative, right? Organic management promotes natural pest control and resistance to insects. And so there's, an, there's a role of soils that had been uh, un, unappreciated there. That's a little more transformative than just saying, we went out and we measured this about the soils and we saw this increase or decrease in number of pests and those things. I see that they're related, but you're phrasing it a little more now in a broader context. Right. And the, the, the um, conference abstracts tend not to be quite as good at that. So that's why we're here. We're working on that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I just want to ask, like, uh, if you're only starting with the research and you're not yet having like the result, there's something like that, do you think it's going to be the same component in the abstract, the same as the one who already have the result, the conclusion, something like that? So I need some explanation about it. Please. Thank you. Yeah, I agree that that's a general problem and a, and a very strong problem for a lot of young scientists. So I think it's still very important to focus on the reason that you're doing the research, the problem that you're addressing, and you can think about what you hope to achieve from that research. And your title could be something about um, if you're using new techniques or you're using techniques in a different way to answer a question, you know, something like new techniques to address blah, 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 the, the main question that you're answering. And then you're still, the yellow part of the thing is still the same, the background, your question is still the same. You could say we are, or I hypothesize that. And then you have the results section is about what you plan to do, or how you plan to use these new techniques or what the new techniques are or some innovative way you're using an old technique. And then at the very bottom, I, I hope to find, or I expect to find. So it becomes a work in progress rather than presenting the results, but I think you can still do it. And I think it's a nice thing to do to present very early because it gives you practice. If there's anything we learn about any human skill is that it gets better with practice. And so <clears throat> that's why I don't just give this one example and say the workshop is over now. I mean, I want you to work through some, ab some abstracts um, to see these different parts because you'll get better at seeing the different parts as you spend more time on it, as you work, work on it more. Same thing with presentations. Do a presentation while you're uh, relatively early in your um, dissertation research and then improve it as you go on. Thank you. Okay, what we want to do next is switch over to some Google Docs. We're gonna send you into breakout rooms here in a minute. And so what I'd ask you to do is to pick in your breakout room, we'll have two people in each room, to pick one of the abstracts to work on. So here's an abstract. They're all gonna look something like this. There'll be the title of the abstract, sometimes a link to the paper, which you shouldn't need, the abstract itself, and then instructions to go in and highlight with these colors, the different parts of the abstract. So to go in and find these parts of each of the abstracts, you'll have 10 minutes or 15 minutes to work on this. You can work on more than one if you want to. And then we will come back together and we'll go over the abstracts and let you tell us about what you found in the abstracts, how you found the different parts of it, and how you think that the abstracts worked. Do we have everyone back? from the rooms? Yes. Okay, so let's ask if anyone wants to share the work that they did and I will bring up the, the document here on my screen so everyone can see it. Um, I can, uh, Solange and I did one on um, pith width, leaf size and twig thickness. It's number two. And this one was a little confusing. <laughs> um, but we we started we started backwards because we thought the conclusion was a bit more clear than the problem and and the introduction. <laughs> um, 
how, how wouldn't you like us to do this? I, any way you like. I mean, you can do it backwards. That's fine. Oh, well, I'll start at the beginning. Um, so we, we thought that the introduction um, was the first sentence. Uh, to support large leaves, many woody plant species evolved a cost-effective way to thicken twigs. Um, and then in the second sentence, they, they provide a, a rule or a hypothesis that they're, they're working off of. And then they state their hypothesis um, that pith width also increases with leaf size, um, which we thought was part of their problem because they stated it as a hypothesis. Um, and then there's a second problem that is um, maybe a bit more broad. So the, the benefit to the plant from the proposed relationship is that pith is a low cost tissue that reduces the metabolic cost of large diameter twig production. And then in the white section, that is um, some of how they produce the data um, and then more background on um, what kind of theories they're using to apply to their um, data. Uh, and so they have two conclusions, but one is a very specific one, um, which is thicker twigs showed more variation in relative pith, wood, and bark cross-sectional areas compared to thinner twigs. Um, and then the second part of that is a, a larger, uh, more broad kind of conclusion that people can take away. Um, investments in pith, a tissue of low density found in the centers of twigs, provides a low cost way to increase twig circumference and thereby space for attachment of large leaves while increasing the overall second, the second moment of area of twigs which increases their ability to biomechanically support large leaves. Yeah, so that's, that's great. I would have done it exactly the same way. Okay. And that's the first thing I want to say. And the other thing I want to say is notice what Lucy said at the very beginning, that it wasn't quite clear. And that's why we're doing this, because you're going to see a number of abstracts that are like this, both for papers and for um, uh, talks and conferences. And you don't want someone to read your abstract and have that reaction. You're trying to have, have them read the abstract and say, okay, I know exactly what that was about. So if we had more time, or you might think about if this is close enough to your area, you know, go in and try to rewrite this. How would you rewrite an abstract for this? For titles, that's something we did in the other workshop. We went in and we tried to rewrite titles, but titles are a lot shorter than abstracts. And I don't think even in a two hour workshop, We've got time to rewrite abstracts. And it's also, you need to know the, the, the areas a little better. So I can tell you one thing about this, since I did study a little bit of biomechanics way back in undergraduate school. Um, the second part that this group has identified the benefit to the plant from proposed relationships, low cost tissue and stuff, is pretty much straight biomechanics. And so is the, sec the last part of their work that the pith is a low cost way of doing this. In fact, it's well known that stems are hollow in oftentimes because the mechanical strength comes from the outside of the stem and there's very little mechanical strength added to the inside. So the center of the stem can actually be hollow and affect the mechanical strength very little, have very little effect on mechanical strength. So they haven't made that clear to someone who doesn't know that already in here. They haven't really clarified what their new contribution is here to existing knowledge from biomechanics. They've kind of mished them all together there. So um, it's still a good abstract and, you know, none of these all got published. So they're not, not nothing we're gonna show you today is terrible, but it could be clear, it, it could be clear. And that's what I want you to be doing when you're thinking about your own work is to um, really take what Einstein says very seriously and just reduce it down and down and down until you can say it very, very clearly and you'll understand your research in a new way. So that's the other advantage of doing this work is not just the, all the things that I've said about getting, a, getting your audience and communicating with them well and things, but you'll understand your work in a completely different way. I, I just wish I had done this when I was the age of most of you people there because I would have reformulated my work in very different ways if I, if I had thought about it in this way. Mm -hmm. Someone else want to talk about one of their Abstracts? I can go. Um, Jelly and I looked at a couple of them, but we, we can maybe do the European presence in the Americas one. 
So this one, see, I think, was probably one of the most more straightforward ones that we looked at. So the first sentence is, or the first two sentences, we thought were kind of the background, sort of previous previous knowledge. So transatlantic exploration took place centuries before the crossing of Columbus. Um, physical evidence for early European presence in the Americas can be found in Newfoundland, Canada. So that's sort of some already sort of known things. And then um, really clearly the problem sentence right there is, however, it has thus far not been possible to determine when this activity took place. So it's a really clear problem sentence. Um, really short couple of sentences on sort of what, how they, how they address this question um, and the result and then how they address the question. And then the last two sentences we thought were sort of the important takeaways. Um, so what this new date tells us. Um, so it lays down a marker for European cognizance of the Americas and represents first known point at which humans encircled the globe. It's basically the broad strokes of why this date is important. Um, so both of those sentences did that. And I thought this was probably, we looked at a couple, uh, another, another two um, abstracts and they were not as clear, not necessarily as clear as, as this one, I think. Um, yeah, this, and also, also notice how short this is. And also notice it's from nature. I mean, the nature abstracts, are, are, there's still clear ones and less clear ones in nature, but on the whole, you want to see good abstracts look in nature. Mm. Yeah, great. I mean, that's a great analysis and I agree it's very clear. And I think it's also great that you looked at several of them. That's really good. And the more you can look at these and think about, look at the variations, we've already seen two variants already and you'll see others. It's always very easy to tell where the problem statement is if they say, however, however, if every abstract you read had the second sentence beginning with the word however, you'd be sick of it by about 10 abstracts. So you might, you know, find some various ways of saying you're putting your problem statement in there. Johan, you said you did one. You want to look at yours? Yeah. Uh, we, well, Vanessa and I did the um, monocot grafting one. Yeah, so ours also had however in it, so it was pretty clear to see where the um, problem statement was. Um, and then we thought that the background was um, the First two or so sentences talking about um, the possibilities of grafting and um, just um, grafting being widespread. And then um, we thought that their um, conclusions were these last two sentences where it talks about how their data overturns the consensus that monocotyledons can't form graft unions, and then that they concluded that graft compatibility is a shared ability among seed-bearing plants. And you want to say anything about their results section? We thought that that was them explaining the specific things that they did during like the process of, I suppose, arriving at the conclusion. I'm not entirely certain how to phrase it. Yeah, I, what I wanted you to see, and I'm sure you have seen here, is look at this ex exogenous fluorescent dyes. They don't know, they don't give the dye names, they don't give the concentrations, they don't give how they were applied. There's no technical details there about all of the results that that they got or the details of the results. It's just, you know, they're kind of trusting you that that's going to be someplace in the paper. And actually in nature and science journals, those are the results are usually put in separate sections even, right? So they're the results, those detailed results are only for people in kind of the in-in group, those little people who work in things like you do and like in your lab. They're really important for those people doing the same kind of research. For everyone else like me who doesn't work on monocot graphing but is interested in monocots, you know, I don't need to know that detail up front. I might want to know it someday, and it needs to be there somewhere in a paper, but certainly does not need to be in the abstract. The abstract is going to get me to read the paper and go into it and maybe find that detail in the, in the method section. A lot of the detail does not need to be in the results, in the abstracts. 
it detracts. I'm hoping you're starting to see that it detracts from the intelligibility of the abstract mm -hmm. and its broad appeal. Bruce, could I make a comment? This is Warren Hauck. Of course. And I, I just, I feel like there's a trade-off here in, in some respects that um, when I look at an abstract, I also want to come away with a sense of, you know, what what is the basis for the conclusions that they're coming to? Do they have a strong data set? Do they have a weak data set? I mean, you can make conclusions based on a poor data set that sound really great. And, and so where, where do you, how do you balance those trade-offs of saying, you know, I want to describe the, the experimental design and, you know, and the depth to which I did that I generated the data that are then supporting the conclusions that I'm making? I think it depends on who your audience is. Okay. And so what I've heard you say is for the people who work in your area where you're concerned you're concerned about and you're able to evaluate the rigor of their results and you want to know that detail in the abstract. And so I would say for those people it is important to have it there. Mm -hmm. That's not the Bondi 2020 meetings, that's a meeting of people who work in your area. Right. Or if you're if you know that that's the only people who are going to come to your talk, you know, you're just trying, and <clears throat> Warren is a more established scientist, right? He's not there out trying to, I imagine, not trying to find a new job, although I don't know. Um, you know, he's <clears throat> established in his career and is now uh, concerned with doing good science and communicating that good science to other people who work in his discipline, in his narrow dis discipline. And so, and reading good science from them and hearing good talks from them. So you could think, say that's, well, that's like a symposium within uh, the Botany 2020 meetings, a symposium that you only expect is going to be attended by people in your narrow discipline. And you might want to write an abstract differently for that yeah. symposium than you would um, as a young scientist trying to attract a general audience mm -hmm. or as a scientist trying to write something for nature or those things. So to me, I, the way that I recon reconcile <clears throat> those two problems, attracting an audience and uh, having results in more detailed results in there is the, I, I think about what audience I'm trying to address. Okay. So we can, I can jump here to something else here um, that we haven't looked at yet. Let me see if I can find this quickly. We may do this later. Um, so here's an abstract from uh, a talk. So look at this detail here in the center. Make that even bigger, maybe. I would challenge anyone who doesn't work on a daily basis with water potentials of plants to understand anything of that. Mm -hmm. I, I studied water potential way back a long time ago, and I can't make any sense of this. Now, it turns out this, this is a really cool talk and a really cool result. But I would argue for the Botany meetings, that detail is not just extraneous, it detracts from the meeting of the, the, un, the intelligibility of the abstract and of the paper. Mm -hmm. Let's continue now with our journal abstracts and see if there's anyone else who would like to talk about a, their abstract. Uh, maybe I can go. Me and Akriti worked on uh, four. Four. So that's very brief. And by looking at it I, on like overall, we felt like it's like a, a review, uh, abstract for a review paper or something. Uh, so the first sentence is, talking about the background and uh we had a like a uh confusion about the second and the third sentence like which one is the problem uh then we by like 
closely looking at that one. Uh, we felt like uh, here we synthesize the current information about how the presence and the type of mycorrhizal uh, association of plant communities is the problem that they are trying to bring information into the paper. And uh, like the last sentence uh, is the uh, conclusion, like uh, like summarizing things from uh, they gathered from other papers. Maybe that's what we thought about this. Yeah, great. I, and I, I like this one. To, I'm glad you <clears throat> volunteered and brought this one up because it's a nice example of someone where there isn't a clear question that they're working on. As you say, they're summarizing other kind of research. Yet the same structure of the abstract is there. You know, what we knew before, what we're contributing now. If you're not contributing anything new in the paper, why are you doing this work? What do you, what's the point here? If you are doing something new, for goodness sakes, tell the people who are reading the abstract what you're doing that's new so that they know what they expect to get out of your work. And that's that nicely done here in the second sentence. And then in the end, they, in the last two parts, they tell, you know, summarize a little bit in the results and a little bit what their main conclusions are. I don't like the title of this one quite as well, but it's partly because it is a, it's a general paper that summarizes lots of um, other research. And so they say how mycorrhizal associations drive plant population and community biology. They don't tell you in the title how they do it, but it's probably more complex than they can say in a title. So you realize that sometimes you have to bend the rules when you're doing certain kinds of papers. I think it's still a good touch, a touchstone then, you know, try to make the title as specific as you can. And if you just can't do it, you can't do it. You make it as you do what you can.